turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3, and we will continue in our series on Proverbs. Now, the tagline for this series is called Proverbs. That's not the tagline. The tagline is Gospel in All of Life. You just heard Ryan pray that uh, we would be a people who spread the joy of treasuring Christ in all of life. You've already heard me introduce the idea that we are recalling and remembering and rehearsing this thing called the gospel. And so as we prepare to look at the first eight verses of chapter three today, um, I just want to tie together, if I'm able, these, I, these concepts or these words, the gospel and wisdom. If you have your bulletins, you'll see that the name of this sermon is called Unself Yourself, and if you look further in the little fine print, by Jamie Self, so it's kind of cute, huh? So the idea then is that, that we wouldn't just approach this as what can I get out of it, but that there would be something deeper, something greater, something from God. Wisdom is the gospel in all of life. When we talk about wisdom, one way that we can define it is, is, wi- is that wisdom refers to the competency. Did I say that right? Competency of navigating through the complex realities of this life. You ever just wish you could make decisions and make the right ones all the time? You ever wish you just had competency in navigating this life, I'll just tell you now, if you're not interested in that, you can just take a nap now. Just, just close your eyes. I can't see you anyway, so just take a little nap right there. You're good to go. If you care about these things, then you want to hear what God has to say about this wisdom that refers to the competency of navigating through the complex realities of life. You see, before we can navigate through the complexities the realities of life, we need to see what's real, don't we? That's why we are told that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. See, when we fear God and we see him for who he is in all his grandeur, in all his brilliance, in all his weight, then we will see reality in light of him. And we will see ourselves in light of that reality. And so we have wisdom navigating in reality that comes from an understanding of God that we call the fear of God. But where does the gospel fit into that? Well, we know this, but let me just say it out loud. See, Christ links us through his life and his death and his resurrection, and his reign, and the anticipated return, the gospel. And through that life, he links us to God so that we have eyes to see the reality. See, it's a spiritual thing to to fear God and be launched into wisdom. I've grown this beard over the last, I don't know, a few months. I don't know how long it's been. I don't know if it's been a year or not. And when I started growing it, I said, I think, honey, I think I'm going to grow a beard. And you know my wife, that big, beautiful smile. Good, yeah, just as long as you trim it. <laughs> That'll be nice. It'll actually look good. Well, the problem is I grow lots of hair on my chin, and I can't see that well. And I'm not the most meticulous groomer anyway. So, but I do care. And I, and I want to shape, I want it to be good. And then so, so I get my razor out and I, I even have like beard butter. It's kind of cool. I just like saying beard butter. I put the beard butter on and I do the trimming thing with the razor. And I've got the, the, the grooming stuff. And I, I, I have some tools and I just use those things. And I, I kind of work on myself and I look through my failing eyes and I go, I'm looking pretty good. And then my wife, with that big, beautiful smile, not so much. She looks at my beard and she says, no, it, 
it's, no, you don't look good. She is like the gospel on the, the, the beard of my life. She, this is what it really looks like, Jamie. And sometimes I go, I sometimes go, thank you, honey, for your input. It's so helpful to have you do that. Now, I, sometimes it irritates me. But you know what? It's good to have her point out the reality of my beard because it sets me on a different path. Like maybe go to the barber, go to somebody professional, somebody that can see even. It's, it, those moments, you know what I'm talking about. We're like, you know, those, those tone deaf contestants on American Idol, you know who I'm talking about? And they have no, they think, I mean, in their mind, they're just the great, they sing like me, they sing like me and they think they're good. Not so much. And we get there and we stay there. And that's what the gospel is like was when somebody says, you can't sing. Your beard doesn't look good. But the problem, the reason that I would even flinch against that good news of, of seeing reality is because the path that that sends me on is taking me to the glory of another. See, that's what the gospel does. Fear God. Have wisdom. Fear God. See him for who he is. Get on the path to revealing his glory instead of your own. And it's just not natural. It's not natural for me to get out of myself, to unself myself. And since it's not natural, I need to listen to someone else. I need to cherish what somebody else has to say. And as we approach Proverbs chapter 3, we have an opportunity to listen so that we can be skilled in navigating the complexities of the realities of life for the glory of God. Will you read with me? Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. I'll just confess now, and I won't say it again. It's, it's really 3, 1 through 12 is, is how all of this stuff fits together. But we're going to go through 8. So if you get to 9 and go, what about 9? I just told you. We're just going to stop at 8. Let's read 1 through 8. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. This proverb starts out with, My son, do not forget my teaching. And it's helpful when we see that he says, don't forget my teaching. When he says teaching, he's talking about the fear of the Lord. He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about the gospel. And so this is what he's saying. He says, so here's the key to unselfing yourself. Remember what you've been taught. And what you've been taught is the gospel. What you've been taught is wisdom. And he says, don't forget. I think that this forgetting thing in my own life, perhaps in the lives of the people that I talk to often, is way more common than outright rejection of the gospel, outright rejection of wisdom and skill. We kind of drift into forgetting. And we're told to remember what we've been taught. Don't forget. Well, how do I remember? Well, in the second line there, he says, but keep. But keep. Look hard at. Watch over. This wisdom has been given to you for a reason. 
And if you don't watch over, if you don't keep it, then it will be useless because it will be forgotten. But he doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't just say, keep my commandments. Where does he tell us to keep them? In our hearts. In our hearts. See, this is where the unselfing comes from. See, wisdom is very practical. But as practical as it is, it's not simplistic. It's not moralistic. What, it, what God is going for in, our, in, in this instruction here is he's going for our heart. He's going for teaching that, that changes us deeply inside our hearts. And his wisdom sinks in as we take the time and we mull over these Proverbs slowly and thoughtfully. We need to have multiple exposures over time so that we won't just take the, 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 the mind piece, the command piece, the, the law piece, and just let it sit in our head. That's why, that's why we, we get on the path of wisdom, this, this righteous path. It's, it's, we are navigating life over time on this path, receiving all of this wisdom, letting it saturate us, letting it get into us, letting it get down into our heart. And the significance of that is this, is that if, if we don't have wisdom, then we can have good things that we do and be in trouble. If we have courage but not wisdom, then we will blunder boldly. If we have faith but not wisdom, then we will make the gospel ugly to other people. If we have technology but not wisdom, then we will use the best communications ever invented to broadcast stupidity. Don't forget what you've been taught. Don't forget the wisdom. Keep it. Hold on to it. Drive it deep into your heart. Because this is what shapes us into a people that is beautiful. Do you, do you believe that? It's this right here. It's not the, the Bible verses that we know. It's not just the laws that we have in our head. It's us taking those things from God and understanding that the gospel implication is that it would be driven deep into my heart. See, commandments, without God changing our heart through the gospel, means that we'll make good things about me. We need to remember the key to unselfing ourselves, to make things not about me, that we would remember the wisdom. Then he says, verse 2, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Now we're talking. Now I get a little something out of this. So I'm going to remember these things. I'm going to keep them in my heart, and there's a reward for me. It is about me, right? It's, I get to do these things because cause, cause why? Cause they prolong my life for many years and they bring peace and prosperity. See, that's why it's really important that we, we put this conversation and this study in terms of the gospel. The gospel about Jesus Christ and the glory of God, it's not about me. It's all about him. Because if I don't do that, then what I do is I look at something like this and I go, whoa, wait a minute, God, you're kind of overpromising. Because I've got some people in my family that remembered your words and they're not here anymore. What's up with that? See, when it's about me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be evaluating all the good things based upon this life. But if I have wisdom and I'm navigating reality based on who God is because I fear God, then I'm going to have a completely different set of lenses to evaluate this from. And what he's talking about here is abundant life and fellowship with the eternal and living God. 
Oh, come on, Jamie. You're just getting all spiritual on me. Yeah, I am, because that's the point. Peace and prosperity takes this life, qualifies this life, where we can look at no matter what's going on, we're going to remember what he's taught us. It's going to be driven in our hearts. And we're going to have a sense that we have every sufficiency and good fortune, that we would be free from hostility and lack, so filled with inner contentment, delight, joy, and pleasure as a gift from God. Does that excite you? Is that good? Is that better than, have, than living longer? Is that, is that better than, than you being rich? I think the implication is that it should be. Now, that doesn't mean that, that because it's a, the, the spiritual core of this is exciting and, and worthy of joy, that just because that's true, that it doesn't matter for this life. This life does matter. This life matters for the glory of God. That's why we spread the joy here in all of life. But could you imagine a long life without peace? A long life without this prosperity of knowing God? It would be a curse. I would say this, that for those of you who are just waiting for Jesus to come tomorrow, I would say that a long life is to be desired. One author says this, The longer distance a pure river runs through a country, the greater the amount of blessing which it diffuses on its way to the ocean. The longer a man of wisdom lives, the more he is enabled to bless his fellow creatures. A long life gives a man time to attain great knowledge of God and thus enables him to glorify him upon the earth. It's good to live long if you remember what you've been taught. In verse 3, he continues with this. Now, this is kind of interesting, just kind of a, 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 just kind of a grammatical point here. When I was first going through this passage, I was like, okay, command, 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 command. So I've got seven points. I'm good to go. Well, it boiled down to two by the time I got here today. And here's why. This is interesting. In verse 3, it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. You guys know what metonymy is? Anybody? But I'm the only one in the room. I don't know where these scholars get these words, but I had to look it up. But it's cool. Now I know what a metonymy is. Here's what a metonymy is. A metonymy is when you take one word and it represents something larger. So here's a metonymy that you know. The pen is mightier than the sword. There's two metonymies in there. The pen represents the written word. And the sword represents war and all the things that go with it. That's a metonymy. So what we have here in three, the reason I kept it under that heading of remember what you've been taught is because love and faithfulness is a metonymy for the commandments and teaching of God. It's wisdom. It's a metonymy for the gospel. Psalm 8510 helps us get the significance of seeing it as a metonymy. I'm going to say that about 100 times because I know what it means. Psalm 8510 helps us understand the significance of what, I, what I'm pointing out here. It says this, love and faithfulness, commandments of God, wisdom, Meet together, righteousness and peace, kiss each other. And so with, with this phrase right here of love and faithfulness, we get to see this teaching, this wisdom, kind of like a jewel. Right? You turn a jewel and you see it from a different angle and you get a, a different picture of it. And I believe that that. That the, the father, when he says, my son, remember what I've taught you. 
Let love and faithfulness not depart from you. He's taking this wisdom and he's highlighting wisdom in terms of affection. His commands and his laws in terms of love. And that's why Jesus can say when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? Well, here's the greatest commandment, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second's like it, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. He's pointing us to an unselfing of ourselves so that we would love others, remember this wisdom, and remember it as love. He says, bind it on your neck. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Do you, you ever read stuff like that and go, what does that mean? I, I've read stories where people took that literally and they would take all of the commandments of God and they, they make a necklace out of it and then they couldn't go anywhere because of it because they just took it so literally. Remember that wisdom is extremely practical. We are not to let love and faithfulness ever leave us. See, it's not enough just to know that God loves us. It's not enough just to know about his love and his faithfulness. If you want to become wise, you have to find ways to pound deep into the very heart of your heart every day, all day. What are you pounding in there? that he is absolutely committed to you, that he would never leave you or forsake you, that he will do anything for you. You have to pound into your heart every day. Bind it on your heart. You have to find disciplines. You have to find people. It's why we do women's ministries and men's ministries. It's why we preach. It's why we gather. It's why we have connection points. And we, 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 we have to find out how to gather to pump these things deep into our hearts because that's when we're going to move from just, just uh, intellectual understanding to an affection and love. The problem is that we are not unselfed. And we look at this and we go, yeah, I mean, that, that seems like it's about me. God loves me. God loves me. He, me, 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 me. He loves me. I just got to remember that he loves me and everything's going to be fine. Well, that sounds good on the surface, but you know what? I think we have a trouble with this. I think it's easy to say this, but it's hard to own it. And I think the reason that it's difficult to grasp because somewhere in us we know that if this is true, then he can ask us to do anything he wants. You know what? It's true. If God loves us and God is faithful and that comes out in his commands and we're supposed to remember it and it's supposed to be in our hearts, then he can ask us to do anything. It's true. And whatever he asks, whatever it is he wants me to do, I can be confident that it's for my own good and his glory. I have to unself myself. I have to be willing to give up myself and be loved by a God who is committed to me and loves me to no end. And he says this, if you do that, then you will f win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. In other words, if you listen to me, my m wisdom will make you attractive. Do you believe that? If you listen to me, then my wisdom will make you attractive. I was talking to a guy that uh, was in my junior high ministry a long time ago. Now he has a family. And he's struggling with alcohol. He said, I found your name, and I just wanted, I need some help. 
And I said, oh, that's, that's great, man. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help. Just tell me, tell me how you're doing in your faith. Where, where are you at? Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. Good. Do you, where do you go to church? I don't go to church because I'm tired of all the politics and all the junk in church. I don't think that's okay, but I understand what he's saying. If you listen to me, my wisdom will make you attractive. Why are most people not in church on Sunday morning? Because they don't see churches as attractive. But here, here's what God wants us to see. He did not make us for mediocrity. He made us for glory. And he gets us there through wisdom. God's wisdom. It's beautiful. It's impressive. And what I'm telling you right now is that should be your expectation as well. Not that you would come in here with a big plastic smile. And everything's just fine. How are your eyes, Jamie? Oh, they're splendid today. God is good. That's not what you're talking about. But in the mess of life, in the complex realities of life, I'm remembering his wisdom. And I'm seeing it driven into my heart day after day after day after day. And it's changing me individually and it's changing us corporately and we become beautiful. You see, the kingdom of God, it's not a matter of eating and drinking. It's a matter of righteousness. It's a matter of walking on a path without turning left or right from that path and experiencing the peace that comes from being on the right path and the joy empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. He said, Whoever serves Christ this way is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Move on to verse 5 and see the second key to unselfing ourself. It's fear God. Fear God. Now, there's a message up here. So you see I indented this for you. And the reason I did that is because this is called a chiasm. Here's my second big word of the day. It's only two I know, so I'm going to work them. There's a structure, a grammatical structure that helps us understand what all of this is about. So initially, like I was telling you in my outline, I had, I had one command was to, to trust God, and then I had another command that was fear God. But what the, what the author is telling us here, what, the, what, what the, the father is telling us here is that trust and fear are the bookends. They're synonymous. They go together. So trust in the Lord with all your heart is the same as fear the Lord and shun evil. Then the next indention goes together And lean not on your own understanding, matches verse 7. Do not be wise in your eyes, in your own eyes. In verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him. And then we get to the point. Here's the result of all these things. He will make your paths straight. What he's saying here, he says, he's like, fear God. Turn from evil. And when you have that reality of God, you're going to trust God. And that's, that's in opposition to you leaning on your own understanding, being wise in your own eyes. And if you will trust God and fear God, then he's going to make your way straight and smooth. One of my favorite illustrations about trusting God is my daughter learning to swim. She was two. She's 21 now. I can't believe it. She was two years old, you know, and she was a two-year-old swimsuit with her two-year-old, you know, ponytails hanging out there. And she's, and we're teaching her to swim, and, and I'm in the pool, and we want her to dive in. You know, you guys been there, right? Parents, you've been there? All right, so I'm, I'm like, okay, right here, I got you. Okay, so Mackenzie, my daughter, she's this cute little thing, eyes wide open, and she's on the edge of the pool, and I'm in there, and she's like, come on, babe, you got to jump. Okay, I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. Working herself up, wide eyes, saying, I got you. I got you. I said, no, I got you. I'm the one that's got you. But she was trying to convince herself that 
he's my dad. And this is, gonna, this is a big jump for me. This is a big cost for me. I got you. I got you. And then she would do it. I love it. She trusted me. And you know what? She can swim to this day. I got you. I got you. And that's what God is asking us to do here. Take a radical leap. Not just because you don't know him, but because you know him. Because you fear him. See, when we fear God, we see him for who he is. And when we see him for who he is, he's the biggest thing in the room, I'm telling you right now. If he is in that position in your thinking and in your heart, then you're going to do everything around him. I'm just telling you right now, if a, if a javelina came running in that door and came running out here and was running around back out here, how much would you be listening to me? You'd be fearing that javelina because it's the, it's the focus of your attention. That's all you're going to be thinking about. I don't know why I said javelina. That wasn't even in my notes, but I got there. Okay? But you understand what I'm saying? That, that's what it is. But when we see God that way, when we fear God, when we feel the weight of the glory of the creator, God of the universe, when we see the brilliance of God, we're not going, I got you, I got you, I got you. We're going, you got me. That's how it works. We trust him with all of our heart, everything that we have. So when he says jump, we go, I'm jumping. And when we see him for who he is, we see the order of his creation, don't we? We see the complex realities of life through the creation of the God of the universe who is instructing us to have a heart that allows us to navigate those things. This is what it looks like. Uh, let's see. If, if you, uh, uh, this stage right here, okay, this is my stage. This is, I'm going to just, this stage, everything on this stage is under my direct responsibility. Okay, this is a picture of life right here. Direct responsibility right here. So in this sphere of my life where I have direct responsibility, I obey. God says, you got to forgive that person? Okay, i got to forgive that person. I have direct responsibility there. you got to get up early in the morning. you got to work hard. Okay, i got to do that. Right here in this sphere, right here that I have direct responsibility. Now, anything out there in the pool, let's say, in the pool. Okay, you guys are in the pool. I, you're outside of my direct responsibility. Now, you affect me. You have influence on me. You, you know, you... It, but I don't have direct responsibility for you. Now, as a pastor, sometimes I wish I did so I could put you in a headlock and just tell you to do what's right. I can't do that. And so every parent just laughed there because you think, my kid too. Right? We, it's, but that's what we do. So if I understand who God is and how God has ordered this life, that I have to obey in this sphere right here, I need to trust out there because it's not in my control. When I do that well, What's going to happen? I'm going to experience peace. I'm going to experience straight paths and smoothness. There's, two, there's a double meaning for that straight paths in this passage right here. Smoothness. I love, I coach football. I love when you draw up a play and it all works together and you score and it's a thing of beauty. Smooth. And if I understand, if I have the wisdom to navigate life through the, the perfect balance of trust and obedience in the right spheres of life, then I get to experience that. But if I am not unselfed, if it's about me and I lean on my own understanding, I go, God, I know you say that you got this under control. I understand that you got Sean under control here, but I don't think you do because my way is a little better than your way. So I want to put Sean in a headlock, and I want to bring Sean right in here. I'm going to bring him into my sphere of responsibility, and I'm going to make him do what I want to do. How, how's that going to go over? Sean's going to go, what? Or I'm going to offend him, and it's going to be bad. And then I can have all of these areas. And then there's some things up here where I need to obey, and I'll say, you know what? I'm just going to put it out in that sphere, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to let go, and I'm going to let God so what happens? See, I'm not navigating the, the, the complex realities of life and what's happening to me. Is there any peace in that? What are my relationships like? 
How, how's that going for me? Here's the deal. I don't know. What is there for me to, to lean on for myself? Absolutely nothing. But I still do that. I still mess that up. And it's not because God hasn't opened my eyes to it. It's because I am unwilling to unself myself and admit that I don't know anything. Proverbs 30. The sayings of Agur, son of Jake, an oracle. Verse 2 says, I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. I can tell you what I know, not me. I am not that person. But I know that person. See, when I fear God and I say I know that person, all of life falls into order. Revelation, we read, you say, I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. You're not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The problem was not what that church believed doctrinally, but what they had become personally. And they didn't even realize it. They had good doctrine without driving it into their hearts, without unselfing themselves. And the result was that they're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked, and didn't even know it. They needed to go to Christ with new humility, openness, honesty. He says, fear the Lord, as we close, and shun evil. See, when we trust God and we fear the Lord, the natural response to, to that will be to turn our back on evil. But what comes in your mind when you say evil? Is that all this malicious, sinful activity? You know, it's, it's going out with girls that chew. You know, you kind of have your nose. No, it, here's what it is. Turn your back on you and your reliance on yourself. And if you do that, finally in verse 8, this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Another way to translate that is let there be healing to your navel and refreshment to your bones. An interesting picture. In the navel, in the, the minds of the Hebrews, designated the firm center of the body. And it parallels bones, which keep the body firm and strong. And what is what he's saying? Fear the Lord. Trust the Lord. Your paths will go straight, and you'll have a strong body. By turning from your sinful nature, what you're going to experience is spiritual, psychological, and physical healing. That's what it means in Hebrew. See, as a result of sin, we're sick. As a result of sin, it is difficult to unself ourselves. And we're on the road, the pathway, not of righteousness that leads to God's glory, but the road to death. We are in need 
of healing. But when we fear the Lord and we trust the Lord, then we will be healed. This isn't just a physical promise. However, I do think it matters. Could you imagine your life without stress where you are content, trusting in God, how that might help you sleep and how it might help you eat and maybe you feel better? I think it's part of it. The picture of dry bones in the Bible is a picture of somebody who is under the consequences of sin and in slavery. And we see that when there are dry bones, that God breathes on those bones and he nourishes those bones and he brings them to life. It's a picture of the benefit getting ourself out of ourself, of unselfing ourself, fearing God, trusting him, taking the leap and saying, you got me, and I'm good with that. That's what it takes to have eternal life or what we might call wisdom. Bow your heads with me as we close. We're going to have John come up and lead us in communion. And just think about where you are and what you need to do to unself yourself specifically.